All right, let's get started. Welcome to CS 2050. Uh, today's topic is a proof, uh, more generally direct proof, and proof by contraposition. And this is supposed to be a sort of gentle introduction to uh, what is proof? What does that even mean? What is, uh, what is that, why is this such an important topic? This is like the most important thing in the whole course. So um, everything we'll do in the rest of the course in, in some sense is just a proof of those things. We'll do number theory, we'll do proofs in number theory, we'll do combinatorics, we'll do proofs in combinatorics, we'll do sets, we'll do proofs in set theory, you know, and so on, things like this. Everything in some sense is just proof. And uh, a mathematical proof is probably one of the greatest scientific revolutions uh, of all time. A proof is, what is a proof first of all? Proof is an argument, like last time we mentioned an argument is sort of a deduction using the valid rules of inference. A proof is an argument that uh, asserts the truth of some statement. So you, you are going to write a paragraph to, uh, with, with certain syntax and stipulations that convinces a reader of the truth of, some, of, of something, right? So first off, truth, uh, proof um, is, is, is valid deduction. And um, it's been known since e very ancient times that truth can only be derived from other assumed truths. So if you have no assumed truths, you, um, you can't deduce anything. So everyone sort of realized very at the beginning, you need to start with some kinds of assumptions to be true, which you cannot prove. And these are called axioms. An uh, axiom is a truth which cannot uh, be proved. And these are often so obvious that they uh, don't need a proof. It's impossible to prove. Um, some axioms I can think of, a plus b is equal to b plus a. The commutativity of addition, where a and b are real numbers or natural numbers or any kind of number like this. Um, here's another one, a equals b and a equals c. What does that imply? B equals C. B equals C. <coughs> right? That perhaps is believable. If you see that, that's obviously how equality works. But you've never really thought about why. The why is because there's an, you're working implicitly under a set of axioms. Um, here's another kind of weird one. A equals B implies uh, F of A is equal to F of B, where uh, F is any function, right? That is like so obvious, like you would not be asked to prove that, right? Things like this. Um, what about the distributive property? A times B plus C is equal to AB plus AC, right? Things like this. These are some examples of axioms. We'll, we won't actually talk about the set of axioms because um, uh, they're too complicated because of how simple they've been written. There's a set of axioms that try to model all of mathematics called ZFC, and they're axioms for something called set theory. Uh, the problem is, is that they're so simple. They're much, far, far simpler than these. These are kind of, we say they're axioms, but really they're not. You can take these as theorems. Um, but uh, the, the axioms are so simple that it's so cumbersome to use them. It's, it's really difficult. So we don't actually define the axiom sets. I think something like, there's this famous, famous uh, historical document um, called Principia Mathematica. And they attempt to uh, give a set of axioms for all of math. So like, what is a, a valid set of rules so that everything can be deduced? And also, this is the smallest, simplest set of rules. And this book, this, this is the, like a four-volume, three-volume text. It's 3,000 pages long. And it takes them like 182 pages to prove uh, 1 plus 1 is equal to 2, right? Um, that's kind of way too much. So we don't really... Uh, care about that. Even a machine proof. I think the, I think the proof that 2 plus 2 equals 4, uh, for, uh, for a machine to prove it takes like 18,000 steps. So we don't really care to, to go all the way back to the axioms themselves. Now, th this is sort of contrary to the, what we've been discussing so far, where we've been discussing propositional logic. Symbolic logic, P implies Q, is supposed to be a formalization of uh, language and thought. Because uh, working with P implies Q is unambiguous, even when English is ambiguous. But unfortunately, we have to uh, delegate ourselves back to English, you know. So it's not often you will be asked to prove a statement or define a statement which is written purely symbolically. Um, it's too cumbersome. The assembly 
uh, you should think about how a program is a, a specification of an algorithm. A program tells a computer what to do, right? But the computer un understands assembly in some sense. So the P implies Q stuff is all really the assembly code. And you should be working implicitly with that to make sure that your language is unambiguous. But the theorems will prove, and the proofs themselves are inherently in natural language, and rather than pure symbolic thought, like we've done for uh, some of the previous lectures. So an axiom is, a, again, to, to say the definition out loud, an axiom is, is true. It needs no proof. It's simply assumed to be true. A theorem is a, a, a true statement. Which is proved. So given a set of axioms, you can, you, well, first off, what does it mean for a proof in a, in a more formal sense? A proof is a, an argument of, the, of a combination of the axioms using the laws of thought. And the laws of thought are themselves axioms to produce and deduce a theorem. And a theorem is the output of the proof. Uh, a theorem is not assumed to be true. A theorem is proven to be true. So using the axioms, you deduce a theorem. Um, a lemma and a corollary. Can I spell corollary? I always mess this one up. Is that how you spell corollary? I hope so. Lemma is, uh, these are simply uh, kinds of theorems. A lemma is a theorem, is like a prior theorem. It's a tiny helper theorem that's used to prove a larger statement. The lemma comes before, and it um, you prove a lemma, and it's it's not it seems unnecessary, but then it helps make the proof of the main theorem cleaner, right? A corollary is a tiny little theorem that comes after some main theorem. You prove some main big theorem, you can take as after the theorem you can take a corollary, and a corollary is like a little dessert. I mean, you get it for free. You just get a, it's like sometimes it's a special case of something, right? So that's what a, a lemma and a corollary are. So let's do some examples of proof. Uh, first, let, let me define the following predicate. I'm going to leave the predicate unnamed, and it's going to take on input n, and we'll define the predicate to be there exists a k such that n is equal to 2 times k, where n and k uh, take on values like 0, 1, comma. So they're, they're positive numbers, and 0 included. We'll talk about sets in the universes of discourse later. But just assume n and k are 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, something like this. I've left this predicate unnamed, but what should, what values, what numbers satisfy this predicate? Say it again. Um, even number? Yeah. Any number that satisfies this predicate is an even number. In fact, this the definition of an even number is one which satisfies this predicate. Convince yourself if a number is inputted into this predicate, it satisfies the predicate. This predicate is true if and only if that number is even, right? Any even number t t has two as a factor, right? Um, notice that we're already going away from like p implies q kind of stuff. We're already talking about numbers and combinations of them. Uh, odd, let's say I wanted to rep make a predicate for odd. What would I do define as a predicate for the odd numbers? Add one. Add one. Every even number, every odd number is just an even number plus one. There exists k such that n is equal to 2k plus one. That's the definition of an odd number. If the universes of discourse of n and k are 0, 1, 2, the first even number is 0, the first odd number is 1, right? So this is exactly the odd numbers. Now, in fact, you could have defined this predicate in terms of other predicates. Uh, every odd number is one that is, is one which is not even, right? As, uh, with n, the same universe of discourse, any odd number is one which is not even. Agree? Uh, any questions so far? All right, let's do our first theorem. Theorem 1. The product of two even numbers is even. Now, I want you to pay 
very close attention to English. Now, writing proofs is nothing like writing code. It's not a, necessarily a program specification. I have really strong opinions on proof writing and like what a proof should be. And a proof, above all else, is like this object of beauty. It is supposed to be inspiring, and it's supposed to have the same emotions. You should get a little high off when you finish the proof. Okay, it should click for you. The reader and the writer play this little game. You know, they're kicking their feet. The writer makes a small jump in logic, makes another small jump in logic, makes another small jump in logic. And at each step, the reader digests the step. It's like, okay, that's true, that's true, that's true. At the end of the proof, the writer, uh, the reader is convinced of exactly and only the truth that the writer wanted them to, right? So you could formalize this as like a program specification, but that's uh, distasteful. It's really not in the spirit of it. Um, and it's important that you use unambiguous language. You don't say it and this and you know things like this. Uh, you may have to recall some things from your English class. But writing proofs is something that just comes with uh, a lot of practice. You, you will have to do like 100 proofs to, to, to do it. Uh, people have, like language is an agreement we all have. When you're working in a different domain of people, they have different subsets of English that they use all the time. You know, I, when I was working in distributed systems, they're like, oh, just Byzantine this. You know, everyone knows what they're talking about in that context. And you have to know what that means to talk to someone who works in distributed systems. You know, I took, when I took algorithms, he was like, okay, just div conquer this step. You know, and I have to know in context what that means. What does that mean to div conquer this thing? He's, what he really means was apply div con divide and conquer algorithm to this sub part of the thing. You know, uh, working in proofs is, this, is sort of the same. You have to learn the discourse and you have to learn how to speak like a mathematician communicate in any field of science. That's the reason you'd have to take this in discrete math. So here's, I'm going to show you a proof and we're going to pay attention to the English, okay? Uh, so we want to prove that the product of, even, of two even numbers is even. Let uh, A and B be uh, two even numbers. Then there exists numbers k and l such that n is uh, excuse me a is equal to 2k and b is equal to 2l uh, again like i said every step you if i'm the writer right now you're the reader every step digests its truth why is this true it's true by the definition of an even number. We defined a number to be even if two divides it. So we start with the premise that A and B are two even numbers. Then they are two times something. We'll call those somethings K and L. Right? Uh, uh, then A, B is the product of A and B, is equal to 2K times 2L, which is equal to 2 times 2KL. Since a, B can be written as 2 times a number, it is even. Now, when you end a proof, you end it with, uh, you, there's some denotion of this. Uh, the classic one is the box. Put a little box at the end of the proof. That denotes the end of your argument. It's, sometimes you can write QED. QED quad error demonstratum, that was to which was demonstrated, right? Uh, so this is the proof. Now, difference between science and mathematics again, you're working with uh, calculation or something. If I told you the product of two even numbers is even, and you're like trying to compute something, you perhaps would believe that. But how do you show this is true for all possible uh, the product of every two even numbers is always going to be an even number. You know, what if it was the case that 8 times 14 was odd or something weird, you know? Um, you do a proof. A proof, besides being this great, beautiful object, an assertion of truth, this is a statement which is universally quantified, right? There's, this is true for all uh, even numbers, right? But the proof itself is finite. It's a finite description. So you don't have to... A bad way to do this argument was to, 
was, would be to list out all possible pairs of even numbers and compute the product and show that they're even. But the proof is finite in length, and it is a generic argument uh, for any even numbers, right? Uh, we, um, right. Any questions on the proof, on the, especially on the writing? Uh, now, internalize the proof and convince yourself that it's true, right? Have you been convinced? Is the, do you have any questions on the writing of the proof, the, pr the correctness of the proof? Right. So there's actually this proof. You can sometimes you can take the proof and extend it and observe something else that is true. We just wanted to prove that the product of two even numbers was even. But this proof actually proves something slightly stronger. What is that? The product. Well, we'll actually do that case. But just from this proof, you can, this proof actually displays something stronger. The product of two even numbers is not only even, but what else is it? The product of two even numbers is not only even, it's a multiple of four. You have two times two. So the product of two even numbers is not only even, it's a multiple of four, and every multiple of four is even. But not every even number is a multiple of four, right? So actually, this says something stronger. It doesn't matter. The proof, when you're, when you're given a theorem and you're trying to prove it, you don't want to prove some great general thing and then, oh, we take this maybe as a special case, something like this. That's not, that's not what you want to do. You want to prove exactly and only the truth that, you, that is described. That's the theorem we have to prove. right? This is called a direct proof. We start with our premises, we perform a deduction, and we end. Right. Let's do another theorem. Do that one. All right. Uh, the product, we'll say theorem two. The product of an odd number and an even number is what? Even. So another qu quick comment on the proofs. There's going to be many. We're going to, the proofs are going to be very conceptually simple, but we're going to talk about the syntax. It's important. It's a language. This is language learning. Um, before you begin the proof, you have, you have to actually know what you're proving. Every proof is done like three times. First, you like actually have to convince yourself that the statement is true, and you work through it. And then you write the proof. You, you, sort of, you have to write the proof three times. First time, you'll just fill in the details, convince yourself that it's true. Second time, you'll do a high-level structure of the proof. And the third time is the proof that you should turn in, the one that is a certificate of the, the, the truth of the theorem. Now, when I'm doing problems on the board, I'm not showing the work that I'm doing to discover the proofs. And th actually, the first proofs we're doing are so easy, it's not necessary maybe to do that. But understand that when you do that in the wild, the way I'm doing them on the board may not be the way you have to do them. Right? I'm not showing the thought process. Uh, so the proof should begin directly, we want to prove the statement directly. We want to take an odd number and an even number and multiply them together and show that it's even, right? Let uh, A be an even number. Then there is a K, a number K, such that uh, A is equal to 2K. Let b be an odd number. Then there is a number l uh, such that uh, b is equal to 2l plus 1. Right? Why is that true? That follows simply from the definition of what an even number is and the definition of an odd number. Then a, B is equal to 2K times 2L plus 1, which is equal to 2 times 2, uh, 2 times K, uh, 2L plus 1. Since A, B can be written as 2 times 
a number, then A, B is even. Questions on that proof? Right? Perhaps you could do this one as an exercise. Uh, notice when I did the when I multiplied A times B, this is not something that's most important, but is about proof clarity in writing. I could have chosen to foil those out completely and then extract a two, then un then undistribute a value of two to make it two times the number. Here, I didn't even bother to do that. I just literally pulled the two out of the K, and I was like, oh, great, two times something. Uh, next, you know. Now, that is that a slightly cleaner proof? Yeah. But is it wrong if you do it the other way? No. Just like there's multiple ways to like program something, there's multiple ways to prove something, but you want to go for elegance. In fact, for doing the proofs to prepare for lecture today, I had to do I had to redo each proof like four times. You know, it's about clarity in the argument. You have to be convinced the statement is true. Right? Any questions on this proof? Any questions about proofs in general so far? Right? Take each statement one at a time and digest it and convince yourself that it's true. Yeah. So for example, what, when you said let A be an even number, then there is a number. Is that like a lemma? Is that, is it really that would follow from the definition of what an even number is. A, any proof that requires a lemma heuristically is something that's hard. Sometimes you'll be reading a paper and you'll be like, before we begin the proof, we first prove the following three lemmas. And then you're like, oh, geez. That's why this paper is 40 pages long. It needs these three lemmas. And then the proof is still quite complicated, something like this. So the lemmas are simply used as a proof clarity thing. You don't want a proof that's 3 million pages long for whatever. You want to make it as simple as possible. Sometimes, if you're thinking about code, you can think about a lemma like a helper function. I keep making analogies to programming, but it's very different. You can think of like a helper function, like you want to compute the max of something. You repeatedly do this. This subroutine is called so often, just make it its own little helper function, right? That's sort of what a lemma ends up being. And we won't do a proof yet that's complicated enough to use a lemma. We will be able to do a corollary, though, today. More questions on the proof, the nature of proof itself? Awesome. Theorem 3, who can guess what Theorem 3 is going to be about? So we'll find out something an odd number, and an odd number is odd. Yeah. Uh, the product of two odd numbers is odd. Proof, let A, B, be two odd numbers. Then there exists uh, numbers K, L, such that A is equal to 2K plus 1, and B is equal to 2K. L plus 1. Then uh, A times B is equal to 2K plus 1, 2L plus 1, which is equal to 4KL, 4KL plus uh, 2K plus 2L plus 1. Double check my work on that. I think that's right. Yes. But then that is equal to uh, 2 times 2KL plus K plus L plus 1. Since AB can be written as 2 times a number uh, plus 1, then AB is odd. QED. The beginning of the proof and the end of the proof are clearly denoted. In the notes, you'll see, and also like in any general mathematical text, it's going to be full of rambling. But then the theorem proof uh, structure, the, proof, the beginning of the proof is usually denoted by either immediately after the theorem, you say theorem, proof, you continue the proof, and then you end the proof with a symbol. 
or maybe the whole proof is italicized or something. But again, clarity in mathematical writing, it's obvious where the proof begins and the proof ends. Things after the proof may be rambling, things before the proof may be rambling, but the proof itself is self-contained. You can rip it out of whatever context it's in and then use it by itself. Right? Any questions on this proof? Sort of also clear, I think. This one, you can be convinced again. I, I want to reinforce the, one of the powerful things about proof. This is a finite description. It's a finite object, the proof itself. But it asserts the truth for infinitely many things, right? This is true for all possible pairs of odd numbers. The product of them is odd. Uh, let's take a corollary of this. Corollary. Make sure I spell this right. Corollary. Uh, if n is odd, then n squared is what? Odd, yeah. Notice that the corollary is less general. If n is odd, then n squared is odd. Why is that true? It follows immediately from theorem, th uh, theorem 3, right? It's the special case when a is equal to b is equal to n, right? If n is odd, then n squared is odd. You don't need to reprove it necessarily because it's simply a special case of the previous proof. The proof previous also solves that one. So you don't, you don't often need to re a, a corollary often does not have a proof. It simply follows as an, a, a simple truth from the previous theorem, right? Questions on this one? Awesome. So we've shown how to prove some things are true. Sorry, how do you prove some things are false? Suppose you have some universally quantified statement. We've shown how to prove universally quantified statements, certain universally quantified statements to be true. How do you want to prove that a universally quantified statement is false? Or want to prove it's false. So to prove something is false, it's equivalent to prove the negation is true. So you, there is not. Uh, not for all n p of n is equivalent to uh, there exists n uh, for not p of n. Right? Am I? Other, other, other. Oh, yes. Yes, thank you. Um, uh, to prove for all n a p of n is false, Find just one, one uh, C such that uh, P of C is false. So to prove you have a universally quantified statement, someone says for all numbers or whatever your universal discourse is, for all possible things, this is true. Now you then say, well, no, it's not. I found one th thing that is wrong. This is called a counterexample, right? So let's give uh, uh, an example of a theorem that which is false. Um, every number is the sum of two uh, numbers squared. This is false, uh, but we, how would you formalize this in uh, propositional logic? This is, first of all, universally quantified or existentially quantified? How many quantifiers, if you were to write this using uh, quantification, how many quantifiers would you need? One, at least one. This is maybe a good exercise. I have three. For all numbers n, there exists a and there exists b such that n is equal to a squared plus b squared. Right? Again, we're not going to be able to delegate everything into pure propositional logic because it's just simply too cumbersome. Like, I really do not trust anyone who uses assembly programming as without having the manual open next to them. Right? You, you do it in the high-level language, but understand that someone else could formalize it for you if they wanted to. But we're not going to formalize things like this, right? Just understand that it can be done. 
and you're, you, make sure, you have to make sure that your language is ambiguous. Every number is the sum of two numbers squared. Well, we have to uh, represent that. Um, if we were to represent that formally, that's how we would do it, right? Um, I, I guess another historical comment is like, it's, it's always fascinating how we have unambiguous language. This statement, perhaps someone could misread this. It would be difficult for them to do, do so, but I, I think it would be difficult. This statement, I think, is difficult to misunderstand, but it's possible because natural language is ambiguous. This statement is impossible to misinterpret. It's pure. You know, before we had the invention of equality and symbolic logic ourselves, mathematical statements were encoded in all kinds of crazy ways. You know, ancient Indians had, uh, their, their encoding of theorems was in poetry. They would have, they didn't have the concept of proof, but they would assert the, the truth of something by writing it out in Sanskrit with a special kind of iambic pentameter, right? And again, that did involve uh, equality. Uh, excuse me, that did involve um, ambiguity. So we're thankful that things can be written in an unambiguous way, right? Um, just to give one more example, let's say we wanted to write theorem one. The product of two even numbers is even. Suppose we wanted to write this as uh, in pure symbolic logic. The product of two even numbers is even. We would say for all a, uh, for all b, that even, even a and even b implies even of a b, right? That's how I would formalize uh, the product of two even numbers is even. Now, that's, that's unambiguous what that says, but it's cumbersome. Look how much longer it is. The product of two even numbers is even is an unambiguous statement. I haven't even named the variables. For all A, for all B, I have to de specialize the universe at this course. See, this gets kind of annoying. This is, again, analogous to programming in assembly. It's not, it's not polite. Um, back to the main theorem. We want to prove that this statement is false. So we proceed by a counterexample. So I'm just going to denote the proof begins here. Proof by counterexample. Now, when you choose a counterexample, again, in elegance, you want to choose something that's easy to prove. You want to choose something small. There, you want, in some sense, the simplest counterexample. Every number is the sum of two numbers squared. What is the simplest counterexample to this statement? This is a number that is not the sum of two numbers. Correct. Now, here's the cool part. What number? One. One? One, is the, one actually is not a counterexample because one is the sum of two numbers squared. Three. Three is the smallest. We, we, what are you going to say? I was going to say uh, maybe a negative number. The negative number. So unfortunately, I have, I have misled you, and I have not defined the universe of discourse sufficiently because I, unfortunately we have to wait until we describe set theory more effectively. But for us, the definition of number means 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. So it's positive numbers, non-negative numbers, 0 including, and they're whole numbers. Right? Those are called natural numbers. We'll talk about that more extensively later. Um, but that would be true. That would be, if, if the universe of discourse was negative numbers, that would be immediately true, because the squares are always positive. So the sum of positive numbers is positive, and the negative number can never be positive number. That would be an easy counterexample. 3, if the universe of discourse is 0, 1, 2 for the numbers, 3 is a great counterexample. Consider n is equal to 3. Uh, since uh, 2 squared is equal to 4, uh, a and b, uh, a and b must be strictly less than 2. So a and b can only be either 0 or 1, right? If they're strictly less than 2, they can only either be 0 or 1. So now let's just see all the combinations of 0 and 1. So we have 0 squared plus 0 squared is equal to 0. 1 squared plus 0 squared is equal to 1. 0 squared plus 1 squared is equal to 1. A 1 squared plus 1 squared is equal to 2. So 3 cannot be written 
as a sum of two squared numbers. Questions on that proof? Counterexample, usually easy, right? To prove something is true for all values over a universal discourse is actually kind of difficult. You need in, in arguments involving gener uh, that have to be sort of generic out. The previous theorems were universally quantified. We proved, you know, A is any possible even number or any possible odd number. Here we get to just say, well, we're trying to prove there exists n, such that not p of n. So all we do is say n is 3. That's valid. There's other numbers that that's true for as well, right? Try, try some other numbers, uh, and I'm sure you can find other counterexamples. Um, right. Questions on this proof, proof by counterexample? There's probably one of the most famous counterexamples in history. Counterexamples is a great way to think about deriving truth in itself. You know, you're given a theorem to prove, you may assume it's to be, you're assuming it's true and working towards showing that it's true. Not assuming it as a premise to be true, but working towards that goal. Um, um, but if you don't know what's true or not true, trying to come up with counterexamples is a great way to think about things. There's a really famous story, uh, the, uh, uh, the allegory of Diogenes and Plato. You guys heard of Diogenes? You guys heard of Plato? Have anyone heard this story before? I tell this story in every class any, anywhere possible. Plato, uh, great Western philosopher maybe of all time. Uh, even today, Platonism, uh, the Platonic solids. Uh, uh, Plato was this great philosopher in ancient Greece. And he had a school in Athens, and people would come and ask him questions about how. Uh, he's well regarded uh, among these ancient Greek people. Diogenes was this, like, uh, uh, he was a founder of the school of cynicism. He was a, like a, a homeless man. This, he lived in a jar. Guy was like a serial public masturbator. Okay, he was a menace to society. He um, uh, he has all these kind of stories that are uh, uh, kind of interesting. Plato, uh, in classic Greek fa uh, uh, fashion, defines uh, man is that which is is a featherless biped. So Plato was interested in a dichotomy of all objects, real or ideal. Ideas and concepts, like beauty and truth, are somehow uh, uh, above and this is, uh, than ideas which are like real, like a sheep. The idea of a sheep is greater than a sheep itself, things like this. So he tries to come up with a dichotomy of everything he's ever, he's ever seen. An ancient Greek man has not seen many objects. He's not traveled much of the world. The only things Plato may have ever seen in his life might have been a sheep, a rock, a mountain, a cloud. There's not many objects out there in ancient Greece. So he uh, observes all possible things that are feathered and featherless. Everything either has feather, feathers or doesn't have feathers. Everything either is a biped or is not a biped, right? And he tries to assert man is that which is a featherless biped. So formally, maybe he says something like this. And by man, we mean humanity here, the object of, uh, of human. Like what classifies us to be different than animals. Certainly, it's not the number of eyes or the number of fingers, uh, because other animals appear to sh share those traits with us, the number of bones or whatever. Um, but there does not appear to be another animal which is a, feather which is a featherless biped. So maybe we'll say. Something like this, right? He tries to assert that man is that which has no feathers and which is a biped. Um, this is uh, an, an, another deep remark we make of this. Man, the concept of humanity is an intuitive definition. This is not something that can be formalized. This is not proofs. Mathematical proofs only work on mathematical objects. They don't work in sociology or whatever. This is a definition which can be formalized. So he attempts to create, he has an internal definition of what is or isn't classified as humanity. And he attempts to characterize that as simple checks. Featherless, biped, therefore it's a man. Famously, Diog Diogenes comes uh, into the studio, he crashes uh, the lecture, and he holds up a plucked chicken. And he says, behold, a man, right? 
So what, is, uh, what has uh, Diogenes done there? Diogenes has uh, created, this is, all, all this is is, is a counterexample. This is a theorem that Plato asserted, but he didn't prove or anything. He just hoped it would be true. Diogenes holds up a counterexample. Is a plucked chicken featherless? So let's say, uh, consider pl plucked chicken to be this object. Notice that plucked chicken does not have feathers. And is a plucked chicken a biped? Yes. yes. So therefore, uh, is a plucked chicken a man? Yes. No. This is, that's, that's the point. By, by, by Plato's assertion. Yeah. Ah, if you assume Plato is true, then yes, a plucked chicken is a man. A, pl a, a plucked chicken is an example of a platonic man. There's a joke, you can Google platonic man, you'll see all kinds of objects that are featherless. You know, a folding chair with two legs missing, something like this. So anything that, to Plato, uh, a plucked, anything that satisfies these two definitions, unfortunately, is a man. But this is, again, an internal definition. It's not what we want to be. So he would concede that a plucked chicken is, is not a man. So what this is, is a counterexample. Right? This is true. This is false. Man here is not something that's well-defined. This is something in an, an internal construct. He somehow can distinguish that which are men from that which is not. An animal is not a man, uh, things like this. And unfortunately, he's the only one who can tell you what is or isn't a man. Um, unfortunately, so this is a counterexample to his definition, right? So there is no proof of this statement, unfortunately, because Diogenes was able to produce a counterexample. So uh, sort of a famous uh, counterexample story. All right, any questions on that? All right, let's talk about proof by contraposition. There are several proof techniques. When you want to prove something to be true, you can draw. Uh, again, you want an eye for elegance. And you, there are multiple ways to prove something. But you want the best. You want the one that has the most clarity to the reader. Developing that is a skill. So we talked about direct proof here. We're going to talk about another kind of proof called uh, proof by contraposition. So what is a proof by contraposition? Uh, do you guys remember what the contrapositive of a logical implication was? P implies Q is logically equivalent to what? Not Q implies not P. Right? So suppose you have a statement given, P implies Q, is a theorem, you want to prove it. How do you prove it? Well, maybe it's actually difficult to prove. Sometimes the contrapositive is easier to prove. And you can say, we proceed by proving the contrapositive. And the reader knows that, OK, the contrapositive is the same as it will continue the proof. So let me give you an example of one. Uh, 3n, we'll say if 3n plus 2 is odd, then n is odd. I'm sure I have that right. Now, this is a statement not unlike the ones we've done so far, right? We have proven the product of two odd numbers is odd. The, you can even do the product of two odd num the sum of two odd numbers is odd, the sum of two even numbers is even, and so on. You could prove those things directly. Let's suppose we try to do this one directly. Proof and failure. So if 3n plus 2 is odd, let uh, 3n plus 2 uh, be odd. Then there is a number. K such that uh, 3, 3n plus 2 is equal to 2k plus 1, right? And we want to, what's the truth we're trying to do? Just we want n to be odd. So then 3n plus 1 is equal to 2k, uh, which implies that n is equal to 2k minus 1 over 3. Is that odd? Well, we don't, not only do we not know, we know it's odd, we don't even know if that's a number. Is that a number? I don't know. It might be a fraction. So this proof, trying to do this one directly, unfortunately, doesn't work. I would be interested if you could figure out to do this one directly. I don't know how to do this one directly. Great thing about proof by contraposition, the contrapositive is very elegant and sometimes easier. What is the contrapositive of this statement? It's N. Now, 
Now, you could prove that really easy, couldn't you? You already know how to do the proof. You could see it. We prove the contrapositive. Let uh, n be even. Then n is equal to 2k for some number k. Got. Here we go. For some uh, number k. Then uh, 3n plus 2 is equal to 3 times 2k plus 2 is equal to 2 uh, times 3k plus 2, which is equal to 2 times 3k plus 1. Since 3n plus 2 can be written as 2 times something, it is even. QED. Contrapositives, super easy, right? Again, elegance. This proof, you don't want to, you, the, I want to stress again the importance of writing the proof several times. Uh, you do this proof, there might be a way to talk about, there might be a way to continue this proof somehow. I don't know it off the top of my head, and we want to go for elegance. <coughs> the contrapositive, proving the contrapositive here is where the elegance comes in, because it's simple. I mean, look at that, it's like three lines on the board, you know? Uh, you could perhaps even say this proof out loud. <sighs> Questions on the proof by contraposition? Do we all recall why the contrapositive is true? We prove them to be equivalent using a truth table. So certainly it is true. A second thing to note is how we're, again, abstracting a little bit away from pure symbolic logic. Here, we're not working with a pure propositional variable p and a pure propositional variable q. Instead, p is a, is a proposition reading, uh, representing uh, uh, 3n plus 2 is odd, right? And q is a proposition read, uh, representing n is odd. So we don't ever write p is this and then q is that, right? Questions on this proof? Proof by contraposition, contraposition in general? OK. Let's do um, another example. Let's do um, uh, if uh, n is equal to a, b, uh, then uh, a is less than or equal to square root of n, or b is less than or equal to square root of n, where a comma b comma n are uh, greater than or equal to 1, greater than 1, say. So a and b are denoted as non-trivial factors of, of uh, uh, n. You may know that every number admits a unique prime factorization. We'll talk about that later in the number theory unit. But a and b are just any way to split up uh, n into something times something, right? Any way you could do it. We claim that uh, if you can split up A into two things, then one of those things has to be less than the square root of N, right? This is another one that's kind of difficult to work with to prove directly because you're trying to assert that A is less than the square root of N or B is less than the square root of N, but you don't know anything about A and B except that they multiply together to equal N. That's the only fact you're given. When you prove something in the contrapositive, you're actually given more facts. Notice why this one was why the contrapositive was easier than the, than the original. In the original, you're given that 3n plus 2 is odd. That's not a very useful statement. But given that n is odd, given that n is even, that's a very useful statement, in fact, right? Here, the statement itself, proving it directly, not, we don't have a lot of information to work with. The contrapositive, in some sense, gives us more tools to build the proof for. What is the contrapositive of this statement? This one's a little tricky to write the contrapositive out because it involves implicit use of double negation uh, and uh, De Morgan's law. If, Look. if a is greater than n or the square root of n or b and, or? and b is greater than the square root of n, then n does not equal a times yeah. b. 
right? We're not given an or in the premise. Now we're given an and. And we actually now know two things about A and B. We know that A is greater than the square root of n, and B is greater than the square root of n, right? Let A be greater than the square root of n, and B be greater than the square root of n. We show uh, n does not equal AB. Uh, if, if A is greater than the square root of n, and B is greater than the square root of n, then AB is actually greater than the square root of n, uh, b, which is uh, greater than the square root of n, square root of n, which is equal to the square root of n squared, which is equal to n. Uh, so uh, a, b is greater than square root of n uh, implies that a, b does not equal n. Excuse me, if a, b is greater than n, then a, b does not equal n. Right? Simple. That was like ridiculously simple. Do we believe what, implicitly here I'm using an, an uh, again, unstated axiom. Do you see what, why this is true? I've, what I've done here again is a chain of inequalities. Greater than, greater than, equal to, equal to. You take the left end and the right end, and you take the, the greatest one here, which is greater than, equal to. Greater than. Not greater than, equal to. Not equal to, but greater than. If A, B, uh, this chain of thought concludes thus that AB is greater than N, right? The work here, you may have a question on. Any questions on this one? Why well, was I able to say AB is greater than equal to square root of NB? Because A is greater than square root of N by premise, right? So AB must then be greater than square root of NB, which, well, we know B is also greater than square root of N. So square root of NB is greater than square root of N square root of N. So that's just N, QED. Again, this proof does say something stronger. And not only says that a, the negation of n equals ab is n does not equal ab, but this actually says that n is ab is greater than n, right? Not that they're both smaller, but that they're, what, they're, uh, uh, both the product is greater, right? Question on the contrapositive, proof by contrapositive, contraposition. See how easier it is sometimes? Yes? Um, my only question is, in the first statement where it says or, how did we go from Great question. So when you want to prove uh, p, you want to prove the contribution. P implies q is equivalent to not p, not q implies p, right? Not p. So p implies q, p is going to be n is equal to ab implies uh, a greater than, excuse me, a less than equal to n. Or, I'll even do this way, b less than equal to Square root of n, right? Would you agree that's a, a, a better formalization of it? Uh, what you're going to do is take the negation of this. What is the negation of that? The Morgans, right? Let's say we have not r, not, let's say not r or s is logically equivalent to uh, not r and not s, right? So the and, the Morgans. That or, becomes this and. Yes. And that's a, that's a great question. Uh, when you're working with it, you, you again have to make sure that you understand the correspondence between the language that we use and then the actual symbolic logic that's going behind the scenes. And sometimes when you get good about this stuff, you'll do proofs in such a way you won't even recall that that was the contraposition because of De Morgan's law. Like, that's true because of De Morgan's law, but when you're working, you say the contrapositive, bam. You won't even remember why it's true, but it's true because of De Morgan's, right? More questions on that? All right, uh, let's take a little break.